our special guest today has demonstrated that he is truly an ally of the CFFC in every sense. While serving as keynote speaker in Tampa last month for the American Ethical Union's uh, annual assembly, he referred to himself as, quote, a proud, progressive, feminist, queer, Latinx, agnostic, millennial. <laughs> So I wrote that down and read it again just now because it was awesome. Uh, unfortunately, he has too often been the lone voice on the House floor speaking out against bills which would further embolden the political and social standing of the religious majority in Florida, which, if passed, would do further destruction to the wall of separation between church and state. But he's making friends in the House who share his concern, and we already are seeing uh, others fighting the good fight along with him this year in particular. Um, as... Um, oops. Yep. Um, so as your Florida House member representing the 49th district, he is now one of three legislators that are backed by the Free Thought Equality Fund Political Action Committee, and one of almost 20 who were endorsed as a candidate by that PAC. Um, and here's a brochure that you can pick up. It's in the back of the room. It's an important organization. I'm on the advisory board, so all of this is a shameless plug. Um, the PAC's affiliated with the uh, advocacy and political arm of the American Humanist Association, and the purpose is to change the face of American politics and to achieve equality by increasing the number of open humanists and atheists in public office at all levels of government. But the PAC endorses all kinds of candidates who share our values. The labels aren't as important as the values, so that's, that's what's brought out in those endorsements. I want to mention two other booklets that the organization has put together. Um, the first one says, Atheism is no longer a political taboo. They've been watching the trending on that for people in office. And running for public office, uh, an atheist and humanist guide. So those are really important, and we don't have enough for everyone, but if you don't get one today and you want one because they're all taken, let me know. Give me your name and address, and I'll get one in the mail to you, and we'll be getting more here as well. So, uh, Representative Smith is not here today as a candidate for elective office or as an excuse for me to plug the Free Thought Equality Fund, which you can find more at freethoughtequalityfund.org. <laughs> <laughs> he's here today as the proud elected representative for the 49th District um, because we believe in the important work he's doing uh, as a lawmaker. Also, for those who don't remember, back in January of 2018, during his second year of his first term in office, he selected our very own T. Rogers to do an invocation in the Florida House, um, which was amazing. And uh, since we've shared that video a few times, I just want to show you a short clip from that day. <laughs> it keeps going. It keeps going. <laughs> Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, Representative Smith is an alumnus from the University of Central Florida who previously served as the Chief of Staff to former Democratic Representatives Joe Saunders and Scott Randolph. He was also the Governmental Affairs Manager for Equality Florida, the state's largest LGBT civil rights organization. And this is where we've crossed paths several times uh, in our advocacy as it was shared. Uh, those values are shared across our organizations. Uh, in November 2016, he made history as the first openly LGBT Latinx lawmaker, and we are so fortunate to have him back again with us. Please help me give a warm welcome to our friend, the Honorable Representative Smith. Good afternoon. That was a pretty awesome introduction. Thank you, David. And good afternoon, Central Florida Free Thought Community. I'm Carlos Guillermo Smith. I am a proud progressive feminist queer Latinx agnostic Democrat <laughs> representing everyone uh, in the Florida House of Representatives. Yes, I do represent uh, East Orange County. It's House District number 49. So that is the Union Park, Waterford Lakes, Rio Pinar, Lake Pickett University area. Uh, I still consider, well, we are state representatives and, and I think that it is my job to represent all Floridians, not just the constituents in House District number 49. How many of you live out there in House District 49? Yeah, we have, we have a few. See back there, Steve, wearing your Team Carlos t-shirt. I really appreciate that. <laughs> so this is actually my second time here uh, speaking to the Central Florida th uh, Free Thought community. Uh, I came back, I want to say it was after the 2017 legislative session and gave you a legislative update. Uh, and it was a great, uh, great dialogue and discussion. I think I stood up here for like an hour and a half um, because there were so many great questions and the discussion uh, was really, really important. Uh, I'm glad to be here again today. Uh, I don't know if we'll go for an hour and a half, but <laughs> um, I actually hope to hear more back from you rather than me um, speaking at you. But what I do want to um, kind of 
provide for you today is an update on how the 2019 legislative um, session went for Floridians. I will preface that with a warning, which is that there's a lot of doom and gloom in my update. <laughs> Although I am an eternal optimist, we had a rough legislative session. Um, this was the first legislative session since we elected a new governor. Uh, and also, since actually Democrats, because I am a, a Democrat, since we elected more um, representatives in the House, more state senators, so while we're not the majority in either chamber by any means, we still grew our numbers from the Democratic Party, which is what made um, this session so frustrating because the conservative, right-wing, religious agenda, they really got so much, if not all, of what they were advocating for, uh, for years and years and years and years. I will give you a recap uh, of what some of those highlights were, but also I want to uh, dig a little bit deeper into what I think a lot of people in this room uh, should probably be very concerned about, which is the privatization of public education through school vouchers, which of course uh, goes directly to uh, secular and religious schools, which we're going to talk about at length in a bit. Um, but recaps for legislative session. They passed a, a bill that will arm teachers in our public schools. Uh, last year, the grand compromise after the tragedy of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas was that the Guardian program, which is the uh, program that a teacher uh, can enroll to be a part of after they've met a certain set of criteria to be armed. That that, uh, that, that was optional, that the district would uh, opt in, but also that they would never allow for classroom teachers to be a part of that program. It had to be someone that spent a majority of their time outside of the classroom instructional environment. So you're looking at an administrator, a principal, perhaps um, some sort of other staff that doesn't spend a majority of their time. So this year what the bill, the, the big part of what the bill changed is it said, we're no longer gonna exempt classroom teachers. We're gonna allow for classroom teachers to be a part of that. Uh, and we're gonna throw, I think right now there's about $57 million uh, in the Guardian uh, program to help fund uh, well, the purchasing of a firearm for that teacher uh, and also any of the training costs that are associated with that. Good news, though, because I do want to give you at least one positive note. Um, it is that uh, Seminole County, uh, Osceola County, and Orange County Public Schools have refused to be a part of the Guardian program and they will not be arming teachers or anyone other than a, a school resource officer. <laughs> And it's just really unfortunate that we got here because I want to be really clear. Uh, having, having an armed individual in the public school is not going to necessarily keep your child safe. In fact, it has the opposite impact depending on who that person may be. Uh, the responsible thing to do would be to fund mental health resources for our public schools in the form of uh, registered school social workers, school guidance counselors, uh, school psychologists, comprehensive gun safety reforms, aka gun control mm -hmm. in the form of universal background checks, assault weapons bans, and many, many other policy ideas that we have out there. Oh, and by the way, making sure that we have a school resource officer for every single public school in Florida. But that last part is too expensive. Hiring a school resource officer for every school is something that the Florida legislature is not willing to fund. That is the real reason why they've brought forward the Arming Teachers program, because it is keeping our kids safe on the cheap. It is cheaper to arm teachers who do not get an increase in their salary or a bonus or anything else um, in compensation for uh, obviously carrying this responsibility. It's cheaper for them to do that than it is to hire an armed school resource officer. So that's, that's where we are and that's unfortunate. Also, in this legislative session, 
they uh, passed an implementing law that in many ways waters down the will of the voters uh, via Amendment 4. That was mm -hmm. the uh, voting rights restoration uh, amendment that mm -hmm. um, passed overwhelmingly across the state. You know, what they've done is they have now required uh, that for those returning citizens who are eligible to have their voting rights reinstated, that they also must uh, pay for uh, pay for any fines and fees or restitution that was a, a part of their uh, sentence, uh, which, by the way, could mean different things to different judges across the state of Florida. Uh, and really, at the end of the day, I believe, as many other people do believe as well, that that essentially becomes a pull tax mm -hmm. because you are now requiring millions uh, to have to pay uh, in order to get their uh, right to vote back, which I think is is demonstrably unfair uh, and goes against our our values uh, as Floridians. Lawsuits on that front, though, uh, <laughs> hopefully we'll we'll undo that. We also saw a sanctuary a sanctuary city ban. Um, I think it's easy for all of us mm -hmm. to understand and obvious for all of us to see that uh, Donald Trump's uh, an immigration policy of stirring up the base with uh, racist and xenophobic rhetoric is the way that they want to turn out uh, voters in the 2020 election. One of the ways that they figured out they can do this in Florida is if they pass a Trump-style immigration bill that makes Florida Republicans look like they are in lockstep with Donald Trump in trying to purge our state uh, purge undocumented immigrants from the state of Florida. There are 775,000 undocumented immigrants in the state of Florida, so it would have a tremendously negative impact not only on our economy, not only on um, the food that we eat, but also on how our communities are kept safe. Because I can tell you right now, if you're undocumented living in the state of Florida, you probably are not comfortable coming forward to report a crime in your neighborhood. You are probably not comfortable cooperating with law enforcement if you have been the victim of a crime or you have seen other victims of crime in your neighborhood. Uh, and the reason why is because you fear deportation, and that's a legitimate fear. This bill basically forces local law enforcement to comply with an ICE detainer request, just so that you know, ICE detainer requests are not worth the paper they're written on much of the time. They don't go in front of a judge. So if they have an order that says, we want you to hold this person for an additional 48 hours because we suspect they are undocumented, that's all it is. It's a suspicion, it's not proof, but in many cases that suspicion is enough to detain someone unlawfully, not for hours, not for days, but sometimes for weeks, months, and we've even seen years at a time. Uh, forcing law enforcement to use or to honor an ICE detainer request we saw in Miami over I think a three or four year period in Miami led to over 400 US citizens being detained in Miami-Dade County um, unconstitutionally and against their will. That's how flawed this process is. So what, what's the result? The result is now state agencies will be forced to uh, also share someone's documentation status with ICE if they are asked to do so, which to me is really, really scary because if you interact with the Department of Children and Families for whatever reason, that could mean that if DCF has any record that someone in the family or that the entire family itself is undocumented, that upon request by ICE, they would be forced to share that information with them, which could lead to the subsequent deportation and separation of that family, which I think is very unfortunate. So I wanna spend some time talking about private school vouchers, because I think that's a really, really, really important part of what happened in this legislative session. Now, I just spent a little bit of time talking about like what some of the highlights were. I did not in any way <laughs> come anywhere close to highlighting all of legislative session because that would uh, there was a lot that happened that I missed, but I'm hoping we can talk about that more through Q&A. Uh, what I do want to tell you is that we created a brand new school voucher program in the state of Florida. I think the fifth school voucher program that we have 
through a bill that was just passed this year. So how many of you are familiar with how the private school voucher program works in Florida, or you've heard of it? Okay, so every single year, the state of Florida spends one billion, with a B, dollars, one billion dollars uh, in taxpayer money on private school vouchers, where for a, a long list of reasons, a family or a student can be eligible to basically have their private school tuition paid for by taxpayers in the form of a school voucher. The voucher is worth about seven thousand uh, or so dollars uh, for the the one year's worth of, of <coughs> tuition, and they can qualify for a school voucher to take them out of a public school and into a private school by any number of ways. Many of them are well-meaning and are good programs. For example. The McKay Scholarship. The McKay Scholarship is a voucher program. It's not perfect, it probably should be cleaned up, but the gist of the McKay Scholarship is that it offers private school vouchers for students with disabilities. That doesn't uh, suggest or mean that public schools are not capable of educating and helping a student with disabilities in, in the public school system. It just gives the, the parent a choice that if their child has unique needs and there is a school in the neighborhood that offers uh, better options to meet those needs, then they can use the voucher to go to that school and they're not forced to go to the public school. Um, then you have the tax credit scholarship, which began mm -hmm. as a scholarship that was meant for super low income students or families to get them out of quote unquote failing schools uh, and put them into a private school if they were below a, a, um, a threshold of family income. And over the years, including just last year, they passed the HOPE Scholarship. The HOPE Scholarship was a voucher that said if your child is bullied in a public school, then you, know, you can get a voucher and we'll pay for their private school tuition. None of these voucher programs have any standards at the redeeming school, which means you might think that the private school uh, is doing a better job of serving your child and educating your child that might have a disability, but that's still the parent's choice to figure out whether they are doing a better job in the private school than they are in the public school. They're, the Department of Education in Florida does not have, and they do not hold the private schools accountable. They don't follow up with them to make sure they're meeting any sort of educational standards. They're not following up with them even to make sure they meet other standards. Uh, it is totally up to the parent to figure out whether their child is getting the education that they need, and if they decide that they're not, then they can pull them. So over the years, what we've accumulated here is we're moving towards a universal private school voucher system. They keep coming up with new excuses and criteria every year to say taxpayers should pay for uh, someone's private, private school education. And this last year was the perfect example of how that's happening. They created another private school voucher program. This, time, this one they're calling the Family Empowerment Scholarship. And what this new voucher program says is that you can, uh, as a family unit, can make up to $77,000 per year to essentially qualify for the tax credit scholarship program. So no longer are we saying you have to be super low income to qualify for a private school voucher. Now we're saying you can make up to $77,000 per year, and that's it, that's the criteria. There's no other criteria. Your student doesn't have to be bullied, they don't have to be disabled, uh, they, there doesn't have to be some other scenario that's playing out in the child's life that, uh, that makes them deserving of having the taxpayers pay for their private school education. There's no standard. And what we're seeing, thanks to many folks in the media who are starting to pay attention, is that not only are these vouchers bleeding money out of the public school educational system as they are a billion dollars per year which otherwise would be funding our public schools but also what we're finding 
is that there's no standards in the private school and that many of the receiving schools have overtly bigoted and discriminatory policies. So this is what was discovered this year. I filed an amendment on the family empowerment voucher entitlement. And the amendment said that if you are a receiving private school, that you're registered with the state of Florida to receive these vouchers for these students, then you cannot discriminate in the student enrollment process on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity, okay? You're probably wondering, we're like, wait, why do we have to do that? Why, why is that a thing? They can't discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity in the student enrollment process. Why would you come up with this, Carlos? Well, because last year the Huffington posted an expose of Florida private schools that had uh, registered to receive students uh, that are, are being having their tuition paid for by the HOPE voucher, okay? They found that 10% of those schools had a zero tolerance policy towards LGBTQ students, meaning if you were a student who identified as LGBTQ or if you came from a family of same-sex parents, they will not enroll you in their school, and actually, if you say that after enrollment, they will expel you from the school. Schools receiving taxpayer dollars saying this. Many of them are saying it overtly. You don't have to uh, do an investigation to figure out that they're doing it. All you have to do is go on the private school's website and pull up the student handbook, the student code of conduct, so Scott Maxwell did just that recently. Uh, you, will, you will find a series of stories from Scott Maxwell where he found schools here in Central Florida, many of them who had received close to a million dollars a year just at the one school in private school vouchers that said in the student handbook, words that students can use that will get them expelled from the school. I am gay. I am transgender. Those are words that can get you expelled from the school. And they would put that as a class one infraction of student conduct. Class one being immediate expulsion. A class two infraction at some of these schools after that was theft, uh, destruction of school property, cheating, lying, disrespecting a teacher. So those are the types of infractions that these private schools said were not as bad as being LGBTQ. So does anyone see a problem here? <laughs> does anyone see that this is objectionable that a private school can be receiving taxpayer money? Uh, and while doing so, discriminating against our <coughs> students. Now, uh, after these series of exposés from Scott Maxwell and others, you know, there were calls uh, from the media to the Florida Department of Education, now led by former Speaker of the House Richard Corcoran, uh, where they said, well, you know, what are you going to do about this? And to paraphrase, the answer is pretty upfront and to the point every single time. The Florida Department of Education is not re responsible for the educational standards in our private schools. Not responsible. If you have a complaint about a private school and the things that are happening in the private school, Florida Department of Education doesn't really care. It's not, not their responsibility. Forget the fact that they are constantly promoting new voucher programs to bleed money out of our public schools into those private schools once it's there, they hear no evil, see no evil, not our problem. That's your problem. So what are we going to do about this problem? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be encouraging folks to send letters to the editor in their local paper calling out these schools, calling out the Florida Department of Education and demanding that they actually start holding private schools accountable and start saying, actually, if you discriminate against students, then you should be ineligible from receiving taxpayer dollars, period. End of story.
But what's really concerning with this new program is for the first time, what they have done is they have clearly and overtly in state statute said that we're now going to be funding the voucher program directly out of the government treasury. Which sounds really problematic if you know the Florida Constitution. Because the Florida Constitution says that monies from the state treasury cannot directly or indirectly fund secular schools or uh, secular organizations. So, so the reality is, is that, uh, I'm sorry, sectarian, I said oh. secular. Sectarian organizations, I apologize, I need more coffee. The Constitution, Constitution says that they cannot receive uh, monies if they are a sectarian organization or a sectarian school, all right? So what that led to for years and years and years was a workaround. They said, oh, we can't give taxpayer money to sectarian schools and private school religious organizations. So we're going to create the tax credit scholarship program because the way that that program is funded is a giant corporation makes a $150,000 contribution to the scholarship program so the money does never, the taxpayer money never gets paid to the state because now they're being issued a tax credit or a tax exemption. They owe less in corporate taxes, $150,000 less in corporate taxes, if they make an equal $150,000 financial contribution directly to the scholarship funding organization. So the hundred and fifty dollars that they would have paid directly to the state in taxes that they owed they are now exempt from paying that tax because they made a contribution oh, wow. to the scholarship program. That's the tax credit scholarship program. That's what it's called. That's how it's been funded. So the courts have said, well, that's not unconstitutional because the state never received those taxpayer monies, even though it's a scheme mm -hmm. created with the sole purpose of funding scholarships to private sectarian schools uh, so that they would not actually be in violation of the state constitution. So all that changed this year because when they created the new voucher program, it's not going through the tax credit scholarship. It's coming straight out of our government coffers. How can they do that without violating the state constitution? They cannot. <laughs> but we have a new Florida Supreme Court three new Florida Supreme Court justices that were appointed by Governor DeSantis. And so their hope is, is when they get sued, because they are getting sued, because it's blatantly unconstitutional, that it will make its way to the Florida Supreme Court, which is now stacked with the people that they want, and they will overturn previous decisions, and they will essentially say, yeah, actually, the Blaine Amendment in the Florida Constitution that says you can't give money to sectarian organizations, that's unconstitutional. Take it out. Just give all the money you want to private sectarian religious schools. That's their strategy. And that's in part, I believe, why they filed this bill this year as a setup, this new voucher as a setup. They know they're going to get sued, and they believe that they are going to prevail when this goes to the courts and that that will open up even more private school monies going towards sectarian organizations. So I'm concerned, but the private school voucher program does not get as much attention as the Army Teachers Bill gets. Uh, and I almost felt like when they put these bills together on the same week in Tallahassee this year that it was a trap, that they were intentionally trying to attract attention to the shiny object in the room, which was arming teachers, which is very dangerous, don't get me wrong, uh, so that people would pay less attention to this unconstitutional expansion of private school vouchers. So I know I just gave you a lot there. <laughs> Um, but I, but I, do th I do think it was worth spending the time to talk about the private school vouchers, and I want to talk about it more through Q&A, because I, I think 
if, if, if anything, the folks who are in this room who are a part of the Central Florida Free Thought community that you all understand more than anyone that this is inappropriate, unconstitutional, and deserves to be <coughs> elevated in our public discourse. Because other states around the country look to Florida, unfortunately, as a model for how do, how do, we, how do we start taking uh, state taxpayer monies to prop up uh, private religious schools? How do we do that? Oh, Florida's got a great model. Look at what they're doing. Um, so we have a lot of work to do to elevate some of the awareness around this issue. Um, I see David's got the microphone, which I think is great because I want to start hearing from you after I just kind of went on that rant. <laughs> All right, so let's do some questions. Representative Smith, thank you for your talk. Uh, my name is Sam Engel. I've been coming here for up and on for about four years now. And my question to you is this. I, <clears throat> I heard you mention this, and I've, I have not done any research on this. I've never actually read it myself. But you mentioned that, it, well, here's my question. Is there empirical evidence that suggests that arming teachers results in more violence from s students or whomever else within that community, within the uh, school environment? Good question. So we, we don't have a lot of data on either side because we don't have a lot of states that have been as ballsy as to pass a statewide law to say that we're gonna arm teachers. But here's, uh, anecdotally, I think it's very easy to, un to understand that if you are training someone whose sole purpose is to educate a child that it is not law enforcement, that it is not security, that are uh, otherwise distracted and burdened with a hundred million different things in addition to in addition to keeping a child safe with with a firearm I think that it's very easy for that person to get distracted now that is not that is not to say that school resource officers are perfect in Parkland the school resource officer whose sole responsibility was to keep the students and faculty at that school safe, basically abandoned his post, was a coward, and did nothing to save any of those students from, from being massacred by a gunman. And that was the school resource officer's job I don't think that I'm in the minority opinion when I say that uh, a teacher who, by the way, and the regulations that are in the bill, the regulations don't say anything about how the gun is supposed to be stored. There are no protocols or procedures for what needs, for what needs to happen if a teacher leaves a firearm unsecured. I mean, we have, we have seen stories of teachers, teachers who wanted for this program to be passed, leaving their firearm on a sink in a public restroom at a city park. Okay, like, use your imagination for how this could escalate and actually be fatal. There's just not a, there's just not a lot of data on either side, but do we really need that much data to figure out that this is a bad idea? Do we have any uh, data on how often uh, uh, using um, voucher schools has been used to promote uh, segregation or to avoid integration? Is there any uh, evidence on that? It's an interesting question. So what's, I think what's become unfortunate is over, over the years, what we do see is we do see two different school systems. The private schools and the public schools. We're creating two different systems of education through vouchers, which I do not believe is fair, but also I believe it's unconstitutional because you know, we're, that's not something that, the, that we're supposed to be doing. We have a constitutional obligation written in the Florida Constitution 
to have a strong system of public education. And every time we expand school vouchers at the expense of our public schools, we are walking away from that obligation. But to your point, you know, we're, we're seeing that division happening the more we expand vouchers. Um, if and when the Florida Supreme Court rules on the side of the voucher program, what's the next step? Do we start a bill that the people vote on to specifically address vouchers to religious schools? I mean, what do we do next? Thank you for the question. I think that, again, my call to action for this room is letters to the editor. Uh, to different newspapers, not only here locally, but across the state, to elevate the awareness of this issue. Because right now, I think the reason this continues to go on is because a public spotlight has not been uh, shown uh, on these really, really problematic issues. I can give you an easy answer, which is, well, you know, just make sure you vote in the next election. But I say that every cycle, and we still get some of these same people. Okay, but but what is what is at the top of their agenda when they're running for office? They're not necessarily talking about private school vouchers, but we should be. We should be talking about private school vouchers and holding uh, elected members of the legislature accountable that continue to push them at the expense of our public schools. I have brought forward amendments to try to increase the standards at the private schools. We saw after this series of stories written about the discrimination happening in private schools that Senator Darrell Roussan from Tampa uh, is going to be pairing up with someone in the House to file legislation to prevent them from doing that. But let's be real, that legislation is not likely to go anywhere. What my strategy has been, it has been that we need to be targeting also the corporations that are making contributions to these voucher programs that help expand them so that they can understand what's happening. The first tangible result we've gotten uh, as, as an outcome of our efforts is that Rosen Hotels uh, announced recently that they were going to stop making contributions to the tax credit scholarship program. They were contributing, I used that example earlier, $150,000 a year. And when they found out that many of the receiving schools were discriminating against LGBTQ students, they decided that they were going to stop making contributions moving forward. But make no mistake, the Department of Education is going to try to get that contribution back using sweet talk or bogus data or something else, I would like to see more corporations step forward and say that they're not, because money talks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That will have an immediate impact on these programs and then I think people will start listening if they saw corporations were starting to pull their contributions from these programs. So you, you, the one part of the question that I was hoping you'd get to was the ballot measure. Is that just too early to talk about or a bad idea? Or have you thought about how that might be used at the end game? You're talking about a ballot measure to, uh, to, to restrict those funds. So a ballot measure is an interesting idea, but it costs money. You know, uh, To get something on the ballot in Florida now after uh, House Bill 5 passed, which makes it even harder and more complicated to do a citizen-led ballot initiative statewide. Um, it, will, it will cost several million dollars to put a question on the ballot statewide, still without any guarantee that it would pass. And, and keep in mind, uh, it was just a few years ago, I think in 2012, they even they tried to repeal the Blaine Amendment through a constitutional amendment, but that failed. So, I mean, they don't have a, they don't have a great track record of trying, to, uh, of trying to get Florida voters to be complicit in what they're doing, um, because when Florida voters see what's happening, the funding of our uh, religious schools using, using taxpayer dollars, they don't, they don't like it. Yeah, and it actually did not make it into the uh, ballot measures for the Constitutional Revision Commission last year. It was actually on the list, right. but it didn't get through. So I've got you, and I've got Brian, you're, you had your hand up. Other questions? 
Okay, there's several, so I will get you. This is great. Mm -hmm. Carlos, um, through following a lot of the work that Equality Florida does, at the local level especially, uh, getting the ordinances passed locally for LGBTQ protections in particular, I think when I see those things, I'm frustrated, and I'm like, how has that not been protected? Um, so I love the work that they do at the local level, because clearly that's really important, but why is it so hard at the state level to get those same LGBTQ protections? Or and, and what could we do as citizens other than letter writing or voting? Or is there anything? Thank you for that, Brian. So Brian is alluding to uh, a civil rights measure uh, that continues to gain traction in Tallahassee uh, and has built momentum over the years. It's called the Florida Competitive Workforce Act. So under the Florida Civil Rights Act, um, you are protected from discrimination in employment, housing, and public accommodations on the basis of race, ethnicity, age, disability, marital status, religion, gender, and origin. Country of origin. National, or national origin. So what's missing? Sexual orientation and gender identity. It's not in there. So you can be fired from your job, denied housing, or service at a restaurant simply for being LGBTQ in the state of Florida. Now, we have tremendous bipartisan support for that legislation to change that, to update it, to include uh, the LGBTQ community. We have the business community behind us now. I think that we're starting to see um, a shift, I think, in the last several months because of small things that I will note. For example, uh, Republican leadership's outrage over the homophobic comments made by Representative Mike Hill in Pensacola. Mm -hmm. Republicans were not very happy about that. Um, the, uh, the signing of the funding for the Pulse Memorial by Governor Ron DeSantis and a visit uh, to the Pulse Memorial on June 12th by the governor himself. These are small things. It's kind of the bare minimum. But we didn't get bare minimum from Rick Scott. We got below bare minimum. Uh, and so I would see that as progress and it's creating a political ecosystem where I think that they are ripe and ready to take action on that effort. So what prevents me from opening a private school that's for atheists and LGBTQ people and getting public funds? If I did that, that would certainly highlight in the news that that People wouldn't want that, is what I'm saying, and that would mm -hmm. elevate the other issue. Right, uh, and you could. Nothing, nothing prevents you from doing that. But also, I think it's really important to note that not not every religious school uh, has homophobic and transphobic policies. You have Bishop Moore right here in Central Florida. Bishop Moore has written into their student uh, conduct that they will not tolerate homophobia or transphobia or racism or bigotry as a part of their school policy. You know, that, and that's a religious school, you know, that, that the, the idea that every religious school espouses these types of views is not true. No, I know. But I'm the not, ones I'm that do right, have to right. be held accountable. Right, got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. I have a question on the all right, the way that they are imposing these poll taxes on the Amendment 4. Mm -hmm. um, I feel that a public spotlight has not been made on the fact that the taxes, the, the, the amounts they still owe were very unjustly, you know, claimed. Yes that any person convicted of a felon, felony is responsible for a $52,000 fine that's imposed. And when that is set up for repayment, if they miss one payment, they have their driver's license re revoked. Is there a question coming? Yes, okay. there's a question coming. <laughs> what can we do to change that? to make people aware of these imposed fines that are out of sight for the returning citizens to pay. 
Thank you for the question. Um, there was one bit of good news that I wanted to <laughs> share with you from your question, uh, which was that um, the Florida First Step Act, which passed this legislative session, which in some ways mirrored national criminal justice reforms, good criminal justice reforms, included some provisions that uh, outright restricted or at least uh, narrowed down uh, how many courts have uh, revoked or suspended people's driver licenses when they weren't paying certain fees. Because we see that as an obvious vicious cycle. Yes. You know, if you can't pay your, your fine or your fee as a result of your sentence, um, then suspending or revoking your driver license so that you cannot drive to work to help to pay those bills is, I mean, that's stupid and pointless uh, and does not help. Uh, so they, uh, we did some work on eliminating uh, some of that on the driver license uh, aspect. As far as raising awareness, I mean, it's 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 what I it's what I spoke about before. It's letters to the editor. It's talking to your friends and your neighbors. It is making sure that people understand uh, that because I, the last poll that I saw said that a majority of Floridians supported uh, the idea that returning citizens needed to pay fines, fees, and restitution um, before they got their voting rights back. So we have some education and educating uh, of our neighbors and our communities to do uh, if we're able to move the dial here. Thank you. Um, I believe Florida has so many Spanish-speaking people from so many countries, Cuba, Puerto Ricans, and most of them feel threatened by all the movements because of religion. How, how could you educate? How can we educate? How could we clarify things between socialism and abortion and the religion itself is terrible, you know, so that has affected us. So how could you educate people? Thank you for the question. Well, we have to start speaking the truth. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of when President Trump kicked off his yeah. campaign here uh, at the Amway Center yeah. because he said something that really struck me. He said, uh, the United States will never be a socialist country. And then right after he said that, he said, we are going to protect Social Security and Medicare and then he went on and on and on like literally immediately after he said that we would never be a socialist country he spouted off the greatest hits of socialist policies that have actually made this country stronger and better and it's not just Social Security and Medicare which 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 these it's called social security for a reason, okay? These pro and by the way, when these programs were brought forward at the time, when unemployment benefits were brought forward and became law, do you wanna know what the opponents of social security and Medicare said about these programs? They called them socialist programs that would wreck and ruin our country. They're doing the same thing. It's history repeating itself. History repeating itself. Making sure that a person can take care of themselves and their partner when they're in retirement and old age after they've worked their entire life, which is what Social Security is, that is not detrimental to our country. That is not going to make us Cuba. <laughs> or Venezuela. No, what it's going to do is it's going to actually make America a stronger country that takes care of every single person. Having a minimum wage of $15 a living wage does not make us a socialist country. It means that we're going to be a prosperous country that treats our workers fairly and humanely. Making us a country that offers universal health care, which by the way can be done without eliminating <coughs> private insurance, 
does not turn us into Venezuela. No, it turns us more into like Norway or Canada. Okay? So, so when people make the socialist comparison, they should not be comparing these ideas or these successful programs in the United States to Cuba or Venezuela. We should be comparing them to Canada, England, France, Norway, every other Western country that has already done this for their citizens and are doing extremely well. Okay, um, I'm a little confused, and excuse me for my naivety, but um, if you said that um, you can't be biased on gender, the definition of gender, is that, um, what is, it, is the definition mean you have to be male or female? Does it, shouldn't it be an umbrella for anything that might go under gender? That's actually a great question. So when the Civil Rights Act um, passed in the 60s, 64, 65, um, it included gender as a, a protected status that you could not be discriminated against based on your gender, okay? Now, gender discrimination has been interpreted over the years to also include sex stereotyping. So if, uh, if, a, if a woman comes into work wearing pants and a pants suit instead of a skirt, okay? You know, there, there were days where employers didn't like that. And, you know, they wanted their female employees to wear a specific type of attire. You know, that ended up being interpreted to be gender discrimination because they were, it was, it was in, in some ways sex stereotyping. A woman has to wear a skirt in the office. That's it, okay? Now, over the years, that way of thinking has evolved. Some, not all courts, have also said that LGBTQ discrimination is sex stereotyping. Because if I go into work and put a photograph uh, on my desk of me and my same-sex partner, and the employer doesn't like that because mm -hmm. they think that I, as a man, should be with a woman, that is sex stereotyping, mm -hmm. okay? And that has been interpreted in some ways to also uh, be extended uh, protection to the LGBTQ community. That is not the law. That is just what some courts have said. So that's why our effort is not to just go along with what some cases have said and what some have not about LGBT discrimination. We want the law to be changed to spell out sexual orientation and gender identity so that there's no longer a question. But I'm not sure if this is part of your question. Gender-based discrimination is already illegal. Gender-based discrimination. Did that answer your question? So wouldn't being a gay or a trans go under gender? But, exactly. That's, that's what I'm saying is that some courts have interpreted it in that way, and we're very thankful for that. But that has not made it the law. We have to make it the law. We have to spell it out. It's why enumerated protections are so important. You can't just say, well, you can't discriminate. Okay, can you tell us how we can't discriminate? You have to spell it out so that people understand what the expectation is and what qualifies and what doesn't. And this is often why the Supreme Court will review cases because there's a split at the federal level. There's different, and, and they've been reluctant to, to settle this issue for us, and sometimes that's Correct. a good thing. Other, other folks have questions? So I can get a sense of the room. Okay. This is great. I love the questions. Keep them coming. I got you. Okay. Thank you for being here. Um, as a resident of Seminole County, my state uh, senator and state representative were not exactly progressive. Do you have any recommendations on how to communicate with them and try to push them towards coming off the party line with some of this? Or uh, are we basically in a hopeless attempt at, with some of those issues? No, you're not in a hopeless attempt. And thank you for the question. Look, I respond to constituent messages and emails all the time. If someone wants to meet with me, then I'll meet with them, even even if it is, even if it's someone who I think is gonna disagree with me. Um, because that's what we're supposed to do as elected representatives. And sometimes, sometimes we get our minds changed. Now, I mean, it depends. 
you're probably not likely to change an elected official's mind um, on a really, really polarizing issue that they've already uh, staked a claim in and said where they stood. But on other issues, you know, I'm sure that you will be able to have an impact. You know, there was one, uh, there was one health care reform bill last year that I voted for, uh, that I voted for simply because I had um, a small business owner in my district reach out to me uh, and tell me about what, how, how the bill would impact his small business and allow him the opportunity to actually offer health care for his employees. So it matters and it makes a difference. This isn't uh, his specific question, but we do have a document in the back called Contacting Your Legislator, uh, lobbying by phone, email, or letter provided by the Secular Coalition for America. So please take up one of those if you want to create a relationship yes. with your legislator. Questions were up front here? Two hands on that. <laughs> okay, I have a uh, suggestion and, and a question. Sure. Uh, suggestion. When I went to public school, I brought up in public school, <clears throat> at the time, this is 100 years ago. Uh, at, at the time, there was the melting pot theory that uh, by getting to have everyone go into public school, you become a more unified nation. My, my suggestion is I, I think that elementary school should be run that way. No vouchers for anybody. After elementary school, middle and high school, vouchers would be uh, permissible. That, that's a suggestion. Question? Um, is there much, or what is the difference between the cost of public education per student and a voucher? How, do they get the same amount or different? That's a great question. It's not an identical amount. Um, the per student funding, um, the FEFP as they call it, uh, in the state of Florida for public schools, it's basically how, it's how school districts get paid, how they get funded by the state. Based on the number of heads enrolled, there's a specific formula for how much they get for a student. Uh, I think this year the FEFP number, I, I think the per student reimbursement was about 7,500, I think. I could be wrong on that. The voucher reimbursement is slightly less. It's not the exact amount. It's almost $7,000, if I recall. I just remember there being a difference of about $1,000 between the two. Okay, and real quick, uh, I commend your, your uh, um, putting forth the LGBT and so on uh, amendment. Uh, I think that's fair. The question I have now, in schools, how would they implement that? Or would they require separate bathrooms for, for other people? Thank you for that actually really good question. So there are there are model policies that are that are not the law, unfortunately, they should be the law. But there are model policies for how um, public schools or private schools or otherwise can create a non-hostile environment for uh, for transgender students, which includes access to uh, a restroom. Um, there are a lot of details that Equality Florida likes to offer through our Safe and Healthy Schools program which is a program that has been very successful over the last few years where Equality Florida as an organization trains uh, public school administrators, teachers, and staff on how to be inclusive and how to respect the rights of their LGBTQ students, uh, specifically on how it relates to bathroom access policies. Um, but I don't think that we would be getting involved in, in that issue on the enrollment discrimination question. We would keep the language very simple on the legislation brought forward. That was what my amendment said. It was very simple. It didn't get into all that. It just said, you cannot uh, deny enrollment to a student on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity, period. Hi. Um, I have a uh 14 year old student going into the ninth grade um, and I was wondering as a young person who doesn't have many rights uh, how do I spread awareness um, and be taken seriously by adults <laughs> well, first of all thank you for being here and thank you for your question I'm surprised that you're 14 um, you are you are knowledgeable and mature beyond your years 
So I think organizing on campus is the way to be taken seriously by adults. I did a little bit of that when I was a student, but looking back, I wish I would have done more of it. I wish I would have done more of creating student clubs uh, or creating a GSA, Gay Straight Alliance as they call it, um, which is something that you have a constitutional right to do, by the way, in Florida public schools. You already have a GSA, so there you are. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, young people are constantly uh, underestimated by adults. Um, we saw after Parkland a tremendous amount of student and youth engagement, and it made a huge difference. So I think that um, speaking out on campus, forming your own clubs, and showing that you are, uh, are community and civic minded through all types of things that you can do through those clubs, I think will, will really help uh, make sure that you continue to get the respect that you deserve from adults, but also to make sure that those adults know uh, that you have an opinion and you have your, you're entitled to your rights and you're entitled to voices opinions. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. I'm a speech language pathologist and I've worked in uh, uh, Seminole and Orange County schools for many years and currently in a private practice setting. Regarding the McKay scholarship, those of us that work with kids with disabilities, we know the good schools that get McKay, we know the poor schools that get McKay that don't have certified special education teachers, don't use evidence-based practices. We know this, but the parents don't know this. Mm -hmm. How do we get that information to the parents? Is there any way to force the legislature to find out that information. I have parents that call me and I give them what I know, but they'll enroll their child in a school because they take McKay and they're not getting those services they need. Thank you, that's actually, so I'm really glad that you asked that question because every time we oppose a new private school <coughs> voucher or ask for standards for the existing yeah. private school voucher programs, we are given the same response every single time. They say, well, it's parental choice. Parental choice, parental choice, parental choice. If the school doesn't meet whatever standard it is that the parent's looking for, they have a choice to not bring their child to that private school receiving a voucher or to go to another private school or to bring them back to the public school. Parental choice, parental choice, parental choice. But to your point, a lot of times the parent is not making the most informed decision. Um, it, it is not, I'm not going to introduce to you a foreign concept which is that many parents, because they have two, three jobs, they are doing everything that they can, working beyond overtime to put food on the child's table, that being very involved in their child's education is nice, but is not a luxury that a lot of parents have. They do, a lot of parents don't have the luxury of being able to do all of this research and be involved in the PTA uh, or be able to uh, attend a meeting with a teacher uh, that that is requested by the school on behalf of their on behalf of their child. That's just it's. We don't live in a perfect world, and what's happening is, to my fear, parents are assuming that if the state of Florida is giving them money to pay for tuition at a private school approved by the state of Florida the parental assumption is that that school must be good. Yes. Wrong. Mm -hmm. if, the, if the state of Florida is giving me a scholarship for my special needs child to go to their school, then it must be fine, right? No. That private school could be a piece of crap. And many of them are a piece of crap. So what needs to happen is if we had a law even not that said that they had to meet some type of standard, but that required that uh, those who received the McKay scholarship that the parent receive mm -hmm. some sort of information uh, ab about what they should be looking for at the private school, giving them more guidance on how to select a school that has the services available to meet the needs of their special needs child. I think even that would be a step forward because they, that does not currently exist. Maybe maybe Scott Maxwell would like to have that information from you. Yes. Um, other questions? One, two. Okay, two more. 
Yeah, yeah. Then, um, so, I mean, the forces uh, pushing for vouchers and the voucher system, do they also want to erode or diminish public school uh, funding? Mm -hmm. Or do they just, do they want to keep it there just to siphon it off for vouchers? Mm -hmm. Well, and it begs the question, that's why I say that we are moving towards a universal voucher system where we're, we're not even using disability or being bullied or income as a prerequisite for vouchers. Uh, we are constitutionally obligate, obligated to fund our public schools, but I can see in the next few years us moving to $2 billion, $5 billion a year in vouchers. Just think about what that does to our public school system. I mean, there's no... <laughs> I'm I'm very anxious about this uh, because it's putting it's putting more money in the pockets of education privatizers, and they're using these vouchers to prop up sectarian organizations that need a religious private school to keep the entire uh, the entire church's organization and operation existing. I'm wondering if uh, it is true that the private schools, the, with the vouchers, they are not required uh, to do the standardized testing. Yes. One, two. Correct. Is, is there an investigative team, like from ProPublica or Reveal or something, who's been made aware of the circumstance in Florida, and because of the implications that you mentioned, that it would be of interest to others in other states, that might be something they might be interested in looking into. And I want to refer to the comment that you made about the um, undocumented people uh, being <coughs> afraid and, and uh, you mentioned that there were several hundred citizens that were held for a period of time. Mm -hmm. And I think that that points to the fact, which we've seen this last week, um, that this is not really just about undocumented people. I'm a Latina. I'm a person that you can see just by looking at me that I'm not a white person. I am a citizen. I'm an intelligent woman. I'm well-spoken. And yet, I have had experiences. And um, I just think it's the color of my skin. So this, and we've seen this week, we've seen this week how um, people have been accosted at the highest level of government because of the color of their skin. So it isn't really just about undocumented people. And I think that we should keep that in mind because while we keep that quiet, then everything else slips through. Thank you. Thank you for the, the question. Uh, first, on the voucher students uh, who are in private schools, I want to clarify, they, they don't take the, the standardized test, the same standardized test that children in public schools take. That's the, uh, like the, the Florida Standard Assessment, um, FSA is what uh, students in the, in the public schools take. In private schools, they take what's called a norm-referenced uh, national exam, which is a substantially different standard, but they do have to take a test. Um, when it comes to um, how these xenophobic racist policies and rhetoric affect undocumented people and others, it's true. I mean, I've seen it, we've seen it in viral videos where you have mm -hmm. store clerks mm -hmm. or just fellow residents of the state or country are, are openly mocking Puerto Ricans and telling them to go back to Puerto Rico. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's just, th mm -hmm. there, it, the racism and xenophobia spills over into all black and brown people over to them, whether they're documented or not, whether they're citizens of this country or not. It's just a xenophobic hostility towards non-white residents, which is very dangerous and troubling. I, I mean, it's, it's, beyond, it's beyond that. I mean, let's, let's just be honest, because I know that a lot of people are probably very frustrated about what's happening in this country right now. I am also very, very frustrated 
it is not enough in this environment in 2019 to just be non-racist. It's not enough to just be a non-racist. Mm -hmm. You have to speak out against racism, you have to be aggressive about it, and you have to call it out. Because if it's just about, oh well, they can be racist and we're just gonna be non-racist, that's not gonna work. Because it's spreading like a cancer around this country and I'm very concerned. Yeah, we've, we've gotta switch out who's in the closet, right? We gotta put them in the closet and get all of us out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, I remember reading an awful long time ago, I don't remember where, that with daycare, that agencies who ran daycare through the state had to jump through all sorts of hoops and have all these criteria, but daycare through the churches had no oversight, and she had a lot of accidents and stuff. It may have been avoided because, you know, if you had oversight. It sounds like the same thing is now happening with the schools and the vouchers. You have a lot of oversight with the schools, you know, through the state, but not through the through the private schools. And it sounds it's to me it's it's almost like corruption and conspiracy theory in the sense that religion wants to take control. They don't want their kids being taught reason critical thinking, whatever. They want to keep them into schools that will give them religious indoctrination to a degree along with their education. Now this separation of church and state was supposed to have in this country. It sounds to me to finding uh, tons of ways to get around it. Like you just, like I learned today with the corporations. What's your question? What, I mean, ultimately, isn't this a separation of church and state type of thing where the money is being funneled to these religious organizations one way or another through their schools. How do you really just stop this? I mean, on a, on a national level and a state level? Well, I think what's important is that we just have standards for those schools that are receiving this money, whether they're religious or they're non religious. That's, I mean, that's, that's something I think that we, <laughs> we can all agree on. Now, you mentioned the preschool, which is the voluntary pre-K program, VPK. Now, uh, in fact, voluntary pre-K, which is another form of vouchers, uh, es essentially, although there's no, it's, it's not like the voucher system because we don't, we don't, we don't have public school pre-kindergarten. It's only VPK. If the parent wants to bring their child to, to voluntary pre-kindergarten, whether it be at a sectarian or non-sectarian organization, then they can get funding to do that. I mean, hardly. No, I started off with daycare. There was a point where daycares had to be, if you weren't for the church, there was all sorts of regulations. Mm -hmm. It had to be adhered to that the churches could not have to adhere to the same Bible. Right. It sounds like the same thing that's happening. The Similar, the problem with voluntary pre-K, whether it's at a sectarian or not sectarian uh, school or organization, is not that there's no standards, it's just that the standards are too low. Uh, now, a lot of the very harsh critics will say, there are no standards, but they're actually, <laughs> the, the standards at voluntary pre-K are just very, very, very low. Compare that to uh, the voucher programs with K-12, there are no standards. It's not that there's low standards. Mm -hmm. There's none. The only standard that exists is making sure that the school does not um, violate any any federal law, that they don't um, allow for criminal activity or violent behavior to happen in the school, which would violate other federal laws. And actually, what's interesting is um, as a as a way to uh, avoid answering our questions about LGBT discrimination, they have often pointed out that private schools have to follow uh, Title VII non-discrimination federal laws in the private school, which is a way to deflect uh, because federal non-discrimination laws, which private schools are required to follow, don't account for LGBTQ students, and therein lies the problem with that issue. All right, two more questions and we're done. You mentioned before the Department of Education basically washes their hands of the whole standards issue. Correct. Once you're enrolled, Correct. it's up to the parents to decide. 
Now, obviously, there's tens of thousands of families that make that decision. Are they being lied to by these schools? Is there anything the legislature can actually do to require a standard, to require these schools to report what they're producing, be that acceptance into college, whatever standard might be available out there for the marketplace to make the best decision? Yes, we can do all of the above. The legislature can pass laws that would require private schools to be accountable to similar or the same standards as public schools if they receive vouchers paid for by taxpayers. The reason they're not is because the legislature doesn't want to. They don't, they don't want to hold them accountable. They want uh, for the privatization movement and for parents to just have blind faith that the private schools are doing a good job, as opposed to faith based on evidence and empirical information. We, yeah, we, the reason we don't have it is because they just don't want to pass legislation that um, requires those standards. But we could, we could, if we wanted to. But on these parts, we don't call that faith, we call that evidence. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Okay, Carlos, it's me again. <laughs> All right, so my question to you is this. You mentioned a few minutes ago how we're seeing this rise in xenophobia, mm -hmm. racism in this country. And it's, for me, I find it very hard to, to come to terms with. For the simple fact that we're in 2019, we live in this era of globalism and, you know, rapid communication. We're exposed to a lot of different cultures. You would think this stuff would start going away now, but it's looking to make a comeback. Do you think that this has a lot to do with economics? Because one of the things that I've uh, that we keep hearing about is how new arrivals, people of color from, you know, whether they're from Africa or from India or from Latin America, coming here doing better sometimes than people that are native born that have been here for many generations. Do you think this is really just a ploy that's being played by politicians like 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 has happened so many times in history before? <laughs> Yeah, I think what is shocking to the conscience is that the President of the United States is not using dog whistles anymore. It's overt. It is very clear what he is doing. Has it been done in the past? Yes. But it's not been as overt and obvious as it is right now. I think the strategy is to stir up racial anxieties. Um, some of them are based on economics, some of them are not. Take the most recent example, because economics is a part of it. If you can create anxiety and you can create an atmosphere where people believe that the reason they don't have as good a paying job as they should the reason they're not as successful financially as they want to be, the reason their child has been denied enrollment at a, at a good um, university is because we have allowed for too many immigrants and too many black and brown people to come into the country that have taken those opportunities away from them. That is what's being stirred up. Yeah. It's not based on facts, but it is what's being stirred up. And a lot of it, though, is, is, not, is not based on economics. When a mob of people screamed at a Trump rally last week, send her back, send her back, it wasn't because President Trump made an argument about their jobs being lost as a result of her, or their child being denied enrollment or anything. None of those policy arguments were made. It was a it was a overtly racial, bigoted argument that he made, which is that if she and they, those uh, women of color, who are United States citizens, three of them are are born here in the United States. The fourth has been a citizen for longer than the first lady of the United States. Okay, mm -hmm. interesting. <laughs> Didn't know that. That if they have a different idea, of what we should do as a country to lift up all Americans, then they are against America, they are against the president, and they should go back to their countries. That's, 
<laughs> that wasn't even a policy-based argument. No policies came up during that debate. No policies. Nothing about health care. Nothing even about immigration came up during that conversation. Nothing about taxes. None of those ideas came up. It was a argument that was made purely on race. Purely on race. Which can have economic implications as well. But he's not even going for that anymore, which is really sad. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Thank you all. And the, the final word that I will say is thank you all for inviting me again, for making me feel like I'm a part of the <coughs> Central Florida Free Thought family. Uh, and also, I just want to thank my fiance, Jarek, who also came out to be with us today. Who is a free thinker like that? I heard Mayor Pete congratulated you guys. So this is like one step away from the presidency right here. <laughs> Chastin Buttigieg called uh, me uh, earlier last week to congratulate Jarek and I on obtaining our marriage license. So we were really excited. I think this has been a wonderful talk. I think it's obvious that we have such a great group here. You guys had some really wonderful questions. And I hope that you'll stay a little while, get to know a new person. That's why you have name tags on. There's food back there. So go have some food. And hopefully we'll see you in a month. Thank you. Thank you.